Amen. Thank you, Monty. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time again. Our Father, we ask that you would bless now the preaching of the Word of God as we stand before your people this morning. God, may your Word be effective and powerful in our souls today. God, may your Spirit speak to us. May we receive the Word of God as for what it is, the Word of God. And Father, may we obey it accordingly. May your blessings be upon this church as we are a people of your word. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. My heart is encouraged this morning as I come before you. Uh, <clears throat> just because of many, many blessings that are happening in the church. As many of you know, we've been praying in particular uh, for our youth camps, preteen and teen camps coming up this summer. And uh, when we began to uh, pray about these camps, uh, knowing that last year they were canceled, and so we had no churches signed up to come for this year, and so as we began to make preparations, we were preparing as if the camps were going to be full. And uh, so we came before you a few Wednesdays ago, and we began to, to mention the issue, the need to pray. At the time, we only had one church written on, on a list, and that was a little church out in Ethel. And we were, we were going to treat those kids like kings and queens because, man, they were the only ones coming. And uh, we were so thankful for them. And uh, we began to pray, and I, I'm so thankful to tell you this morning that uh, the, the list is growing, and there are churches that are uh, already signed up, and several churches that I believe will be signing up this week. Some have come through and toured the facility. Some that have never, churches that have never been here before. And uh, right now we're looking at probably a, 150 uh, people signed up since we began praying a couple of weeks ago. So we are, we are thrilled with what is going on. And I bring it up to you not only to rejoice in, in that, knowing that, that that is an incredible answer to prayer and that God is doing a work, but here's something more I want you to think about. Those teenagers and youth and preteens that will be here those weeks, they're, they're, they're not unlike the adults that come here during the Bible conferences. Some will come because that is what they uh, plan to do. They, some have been here before, some have not. People come here for all sorts of reasons. In fact, you could say it about this congregation this morning. There are a variety of reasons why you are here today. But one thing I believe with all of my heart, and I've already said it once this morning, but I don't mind repeating it again, that I believe when God brings people here to Milldale, they're here by divine appointment. I don't believe anybody comes here by accident. I don't believe, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what their reason is for coming. What matters to me is why did God bring them? And I want to ask every one of you here today, why do you think God? brought you here? Why are you here? Why are you at this place at this time? Why? Why now? Is it by accident? Is it by circumstance? Is it by just your own choice? Or has God brought you here for a divine appointment? Something I want you to consider as you turn to Luke chapter number 23 this morning. Luke chapter 23, as I continue this series that I've entitled, uh, The Cross Through the Eyes of Different People, Through Different Eyes. This morning, we're going to look at the cross through the eyes of a bystander. Just what you might think of as a random person. Just a random bystander. I want you to see the cross from this person's eyes. It's recorded in Luke chapter 23. When you get to this point in the text that I'm going to take you to midway through this chapter, Jesus Christ has already been arrested. He's already been beaten. He's already been put on trial. He's already been uh, ex uh, 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 sentenced for execution to be crucified. He's already been given the cross, put on his back, and he's walking it down the, the Via Della Rosa to... Uh, a mountain outside of town that is called Golgotha, 
also known as the place of the skull. In the Latin Bible, it was called Calvary. And so we sing about Golgotha, or we sing about Calvary. It is the place where the crucifixion of Jesus Christ took place. When we get to the point we're going to look at in this story, Jesus is walking down the road in the city of Jerusalem, headed out of town, being followed by all of those people that day, headed toward Calvary. And this is what happens. Luke chapter 23 and verse 26. And as they led him away, they seized one, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Now this is a strange circumstance. Jesus carrying the cross down the road, and it says here that as they led him away, they is referring to, uh, in particular, the Roman guards, but also it, it included the religious leaders and all of the crowd that was standing around. But in particular, the Roman guards who were in charge of getting Jesus from Pilate's house to Calvary, the Roman guards realized that Jesus wasn't going to make it. Probably because he was so weak physically from the beating and the torture that he had went through, that he just probably, he might not make it physically. He might not be able to carry the weight of that cross. It would have been a difficult thing for anybody to carry on any day, but after the torture that Jesus had went through, the pain and the, the beatings and, and the bleeding and, and probably the dehydration that was already in his body and all that was going on, it was just difficult for Jesus to carry this cross through this crowd. And so the Roman soldiers see what's going on. Maybe at that moment they realized he was stumbling. Maybe it was just the whole thing was taking too long and Jesus was going too slow. For whatever reason, the Bible says they turned into the crowd and they seized the man. The Roman guards had the authority to just grab people off the streets and make them do whatever they wanted them to do. And so they seized the man, the Bible says. They seized the guy, his name is Simon, and they have him help Jesus carry the cross. It says here that they put him behind Jesus. Now, I'm assuming that, that it might have been right behind Jesus so that, that he could carry the bulk of the weight. Some assume that maybe they put Simon at the foot of the cross where it was dragging on the cobblestone of the, of the street and was probably getting caught on every, every little crevice in the street and just causing the cross to be that much more heavy and harder to carry. And so maybe they put Simon back there and made him pack the, the, the foot of the cross. Either way, he's behind Jesus, and he's helping Jesus. This random guy, this random bystander, is pulled out of the crowd and told to help Jesus pack this cross. Was this by random choice? Random coincidence? Well, there's some interesting things that I want you to know. Number one, write this down. This man went from being random, a random bystander, to being renowned because this man has a, write it down, a name. He has a name. Luke calls him Simon. So maybe nobody knew this man's name that day. Maybe nobody knew. Maybe he was just another face in the crowd. But by the time Luke writes his gospel, everybody knows this man. His name is Simon. They know his name. In fact, they know what town he comes from. Luke says that he is Simon of Cyrene. In fact, turn in your Bibles. I want you to, you can hold your place in Luke if you want, but turn over to Matthew chapter 27, and you'll see uh, in Matthew 27, in fact, I'll put it in your notes if you, if you want to just look in your notes. It says here in Matthew, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled him, this man, to carry the cross. So both Luke and Matthew knew the city that he came from. Same thing you find in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 15, 21. Again, I'll put it in your notes so you can see it quickly. It says they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. So this man has a name, and they know what city 
he's from. So, this is interesting. In fact, he's from Cyrene. In fact, maybe in your Bible, you might turn to some place you don't often turn to, to the very back where the maps are. If you got some maps in the back of your Bible, you might want to look at this. If you're good with geography, you might care. If, you, if you're not good with geography, don't worry about it. Just bear with us for a moment. Probably way back, one of the last final maps in your Bible, you'll see sort of the picture of the Mediterranean Sea with Europe on top of your map, and then you'd have the north part of Africa at the bottom of your map, and Israel over on the right-hand side. Do you see that? Well, if you look down at the bottom, where, where Africa is, you'll see, probably in your Bible, Cyrene. Cyrene's on the northern coast of Africa. It is to the west of Egypt. It was what is in current-day Libya. Maybe you're familiar with Libya, that's where... Muammar Gaddafi was doing all of his things in, in Libya, which was in those days, Cyrene. So here's a man named Simon from Africa. He's an African, and he's there on the streets of Jerusalem while Jesus is being crucified. What was he doing there? Well, apparently si Simon was a Jew. He was an African Jew. There were Jews that lived there in the northern part of Africa. And every, uh, you know, when they had the Passover every year, there would be Jews from all over the world that would travel to Jerusalem for the Passover. And in those days, you didn't go every year. You, you, you might have you could save up enough money to go once in your life. But for whatever reason, this particular year, Simon was going to Jerusalem for the Passover. He was coming into the country for the Passover, a Jew from Cyrene. Interesting to think about. In fact, if you'll notice in your notes on Mark chapter 15, it, it even mentions Simon has some children. Maybe those children were with him that day. So get this in your mind. I want you to just play it in the theater of your imagination. Here's a man, an African Jew from Cyrene, saves up enough money may have took him years to save up enough money. And then he goes on this journey to Jerusalem to see the Passover. What is the Passover? The Passover was that yearly celebration where they remembered the exodus of Egypt, of, out of Egypt, where Israel was delivered, and they crossed the Red Sea, and they were taken to the Promised Land. The right? It was called the Passover celebration because the, the death angel passed over their houses if they had the blood on the doorposts and all of that. You remember that story? So every year they celebrated the Passover. And they, it was a great, great feast in Jerusalem and a great religious ceremony. This man saved up enough money to finally go. Now think about the path that he would have had to go through. From Cyrene, he would have had to pass through Egypt. <laughs> so he probably went along a very similar path that God had taken the children of Israel during the Exodus. Now, he couldn't have crossed the Red Sea the same way because God had opened the Red Sea, so he had to go around the Red Sea. And, uh, but I'm sure that that was quite an experience to go around the Red Sea. Maybe he had his two little boys with him, and he stopped enough there that day to tell them the story of God opening that great sea and Moses uh, walking with the children of Israel across the Red Sea on dry ground, and how that God had closed up the sea and destroyed Pharaoh and his army. What an experience and a teaching moment that had to be. Then he would have had to take a path through the Sinai Peninsula. You can notice there on the map, which is, we would refer to it these days as Saudi Arabia. And so he had to go through that peninsula. That's where Moses received the uh, Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, somewhere in that area. Maybe he even spent enough time to tell his children about that. That the law that we have and the law that I teach you and the law that defines us as a Jewish people was given to us here in this wilderness, in the Sinai wilderness, to our forefather Moses. They make their way all the way to the city of David. And there they get to see the city of David in the beautiful temple. And uh, there they get to, to be participants in this Passover celebration. But the interesting thing is, this year, of all the years, when they get to Jerusalem, and they're making their way through the city, 
there's this great crowd and this great commotion and this great disturbance because there's about to be three men executed. Simon wouldn't have known what was going on. He wouldn't have known any of those men, much less Jesus of Nazareth. Simon's an outsider. He's a foreigner. He's just come into the country, the writers say. He's just come into the country. He has no idea what's going on. All he's doing is standing on the side of a street, letting this great procession go by. You ever been stuck on the side of the road while waiting on a parade or something to go by? That's all the man's doing. When all of a sudden some Roman guards grabbing, seizing, drag him into the street and tell him to get himself underneath this cross and follow and help this man carry this cross to his execution. Is all of this random? This man has a name. This man has a town. This man has a family. It says there in Mark 15, 21 that he is the father of Alexander and Rufus. So he's got these two boys that we all know about for some reason. Wouldn't have known those two boys that day, but since that day, they knew Simon's name, they knew his town, they knew his children. And here they are on the side of this road, a random bystander. Or, maybe as number two in your notes, I would suggest that none of this was by accident. None of it was by accident. Even though Simon didn't know what was going to happen that day, even though the Roman soldiers hadn't planned on grabbing anybody, I believe that God had a divine appointment for Simon that day. I believe that. And because of what we're going to see, in fact, I'm going to prove it to you. Number three, write this down. Simon went from being an eyewitness to a believer, to a believer and a witness for Jesus Christ. You could write, he went from being an eyewitness to a believer and a witness. You see, I want you to think about this. Here's Simon. Following Jesus Christ all the way to the cross, that makes Simon an eyewitness of the crucifixion. He watches everything that takes place that day. I guarantee you he's stuck around. I mean, just imagine what's going through. His, he just walked with this man to his place of execution. I'm sure with all that he saw going on as he walked with him, the sneers, the mockery, people spitting on him. Why? I'm sure he was paying attention. What in the world did this man do? Probably at first thinking, he probably deserves whatever he's getting, but I wonder what he did. What did he possibly do that made all of Jerusalem hate him so much? So he listens. And what did he hear? Well, you know the story of what all went on at the crucifixion. He would have heard that this man claims to be God. That's why he must die. Well, how strange that must have been. Simon had come to the city to meet with God. Is this really God in front of me? Simon had been saving for years to come and see the beautiful temple and the glory of the temple in the city of David. But are you telling me this man, this man that is so ugly and horrible and weak, can't even carry this piece of wood down the street, this man is God? I've come here to this city to celebrate the Passover. The Passover. Where God says that I'm going to give you a substitute, a lamb that will be slain for you so that you will not be slain. 
In the Passover, you remember in Exodus, they had to take that lamb and kill that lamb and use that blood on the doorpost for that death angel to pass over. All signifying that one day there would be a lamb slain, the lamb of God. And Simon had to look at this man and say, really, is this the lamb of God? He stayed. I guarantee you he stayed. He paid attention. He came that week to worship God, and he ended up meeting God face to face. And everything that he saw and everything that he heard ultimately convinced him that this man, Jesus Christ, is truly God. We know that by what went on to happen to Simon. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. But I want you to think about this. Simon is an eyewitness Simon saw Jesus with his own eyes and saw the crucifixion from a perspective that nobody else had. Simon didn't just see Jesus carry the cross. Simon carried the cross with him. Simon was closer to Jesus than the disciples. He was closer to Jesus than Mary. He was closer to Jesus than the two thieves that crucified on each side of him. Simon was right next to the man. Jesus Christ, and watched him in the final few yards of his life, the final few feet of his life, the final few minutes of his life, Simon had the greatest perspective to know whether or not this Jesus is for real. And was thoroughly convinced that this Jesus is God. He became a believer. And he also became a witness. That's how I know that he became a believer because of what happened. Immediately, the gospel spread to Cyrene. Write this down in number four. The gospel immediately spread to North Africa, to Cyrene, North Africa. We know that many were converted to Christianity there and the synagogue that, that he had been worshiping in as, a, as a, an African Jew in their Jewish synagogue in Cyrene was converted to Christianity and that whole area became converted to Christianity. I'm going to prove it to you in a moment. But I want you to know this is significant in church history. It was in this area, not far from here, that you had even... Uh, have you ever heard of St. Augustine? or St. Augustine, at different ways to pronounce his name, this is the area he was serving in. This is where he was from. This area became converted to Christianity. And many were there, and many were sent out from there. And the only person that could have brought them the gospel had to have been a man from Cyrene who had been in Jerusalem recently, and that was Simon himself. Simon literally became a believer in Jerusalem at the foot of the cross and went back to his country to tell them, listen guys, the God we've been worshiping and studying about, I have met him face to face and his name is Jesus Christ. So much so that number five, the church in Cyrene sent missionaries to Antioch. They sent missionaries to Antioch Antioch is the church that sent out, write this down, the Apostle Paul. And I want to prove this to you. Notice in Acts chapter 11, again, I've written it down in your notes so we can save time this morning in turning in our Bibles. But in Acts eleven twenty, 20, it says, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and what? Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching what? The Lord Jesus. So, In the book of Acts, shortly after the the ascension of Jesus Christ and all that was going on, you've already got so many converts in Cyrene, North Africa, that they are sending missionaries. They're already sending missionaries back to the Middle East. You see, they became converted quickly. They became some of the original New Testament Christians, so much so that they were ahead of everybody else. How could they get ahead of everybody else? Because Simon was there that day at the cross, 
And he saddled back up his boys and headed back home with good news and converted that church to Christianity and began, they all began to grow in Christ so much so that they sent missionaries to Antioch. Notice in Acts 13 verse 1 in your notes. And there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barabbas, Simeon who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And who is Saul? That's the Apostle Paul. So it's listing for us all these men in the church. And among the prophets and teachers, or another word you could have called them was elders in that church, was this guy, Lucius of Cyrene. Notice there was another guy, Simeon of Niger, which was also from Africa. So they had these missionaries from Africa, one in particular from Simon's church in Cyrene, is now an elder of the church in Antioch, the church that was discipling a man named Saul who would eventually become the Apostle Paul. That means what happened that day on the side of that street what a random bystander ends up being a man <laughs> who goes back to his church. They have this revival, this, this great awakening to Christianity. They become so passionate about the gospel, they're sending missionaries. Missionaries that are so true men of the word that God uses them as teachers and elders to disciple Saul and become his pastor. Isn't this good stuff? <clears throat> I mean, this is interesting, isn't it? Now think about this, number six. The church in Rome knew this family. How do you know that? How do we know the church in Rome knew the family? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, Mark wrote his book while in Rome. And Mark mentions Simon of Cyrene. And also Mark mentions the children Alexander and Rufus. Did you notice that? Mark knew the whole family. Mark knew <clears throat> that, that not only do we know Simon, but we know his children. We know, we know, uh, we know of, of, of Alexander, we know of Rufus, we know these people in Rome, and when I write this letter and I'm sending it to the churches back in Jerusalem, all of them know Simon and Alexander and Rufus. So he mentions them by name, and he doesn't even have to describe anything about them. They know them. And watch this. I want you to see something. Some have asked, does the Apostle Paul know Simon of Cyrene? If he was this important, if, if, if Simon's disciples became Paul's pastor, I mean, that's epic. Are we just guessing? or Because you would think if Paul's pastor was discipled by Simon, then Paul probably had heard about Simon and knew Simon. Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think? All right, turn with me to Romans chapter 16 and verse 13. I want you to see something. Romans chapter 16 and verse 13. Paul writes the book of Romans to the church in Rome. And when he gets to the end, to chapter 16, Paul does what he normally does. He starts greeting people, right? mentioning all the people that he knows. And notice what he says in Romans 16 and verse 13. Greet Rufus. <laughs> Rufus is now in Rome. He mentions Rufus by his name, doesn't say anything else. Why? Because everybody knows Rufus, the son of Simon, of Cyrene, who helped carry the cross. Greet Rufus. Not only that, not only greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, but also greet who? 
his mother, who was a mother to me. I should have saved this sermon for Mother's Day, amen? I don't know if there could have ever been a more honorable statement written about a mother than that statement when Paul says, hey, greet Rufus' mother. Paul didn't just know her. Paul didn't just hear about her. He said, greet her because that woman was a mother to me. Which you can then fill in the blanks. Paul knew this family like they were his own family. Now, why does all this matter? Because I'm here to tell you this morning, my friend, that you are not here by accident. There's not a random bystander in this room this morning. I'm telling you there has never been an accident in this world ever from God's perspective. Everything that ever happens, I want you to see this is a perfect story. And notice the Bible didn't make a big deal about it. They didn't even tell, I had to piece it all together to figure out what happened. Because you know what? With God, this is commonplace. This is just normal. God has brought you here this morning, friend, because if you will become a witness, a true believer and a witness. Through you, God can change this world. And there may never be anything written about you. Notice there was no sayings written that Simon ever said. Simon never wrote a book. Simon was just Simon. You know, he was just a dad. He was just a dad that was following God the best he knew how when God plucks him out of a crowd and changes the world. Two thousand years later, we're reading about Simon. Because I believe God wants to pluck some of you out of this crowd. I believe this story isn't over. In fact, I left the last line in your notes blank. You know why? That line needs to be filled in with your life. You're the next chapter. Some of you in here this morning need to be saved today. God has given you another chance right here. Jesus Christ is calling you to salvation this morning. You don't need to see any more than you've already seen. You've got eyewitnesses account. You've got people that have been that were so close to Jesus you can't get any closer to him. You don't need any more information. You need to get right. You need to repent. You need to let Jesus become Lord of your life.